and welcome to another episode of AI Unveiled. I'm your guest host, Vivian Chang. Today, we are joined by Eris Druk, the co-founder and CEO of Freed, an AI scribe that frees clinicians from managing electronic health records. By automating the note-taking process, Freed allows doctors to focus more on patient care and less on administrative tasks. Freed garnered more than 10 million in ARR within its first year and shows no signs of stopping. In this episode, we dig into how Ares' approach has changed as a two-time founder, how to stand out in a competitive market, and how to ensure you're the right person to solve a customer's pain point. Let's get into it. Ares, welcome. It's so great to have you. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So for those of you who might not know, could you give us a brief summary of what Freed does? Freed is an AI scribe. So this is for clinicians or doctors. Uh, it listens to their conversations with the patients and write the medical notes for them. And the result of that is that, is that Freed frees the clinician from being on the keyboard, as we all have seen when we went to the doctor, and allows them to be more present. Yeah, and to put that into numbers, a clinician typically spends how many hours of their day, you know, transcribing, putting data into the EHR, and, and kind of the time savings, what does, what does Freed help with there? So I met my wife, Gabby, who's a, a doctor, seven years ago, just before she started med school. And every single day, the, no, the, this, this, the sentence I have notes to do has been said to me. So it's really all the time. And I can tell you, when we started Creed, I went to shadow a, a, a doctor in one of the clinics here in, in Santa Rosa. And it's amazing how everything surrounds really the EHR and putting those notes in. And it's, uh, it's really what they do. And we have that in common as both of our spouses are clinicians. And I think what's really interesting is the rest. what the rest of the world doesn't know is how much time clinicians spend with sort of this manual back office work that doesn't really add value to their jobs and reduces time spent with their actual patients. I'd love to hear more about, so it sounds like the story of Freed is very much inspired by Gabby, your wife, and kind of the pain points that she had going through training and as a doctor. I'd also love to hear more about your background in particular. Um, I know you're a former founder. Would love to hear more about that and sort of, you know, what led you to start Freed beyond just um, wanting seeing this pain point that Gabby had in her in her uh, daily life. Grew up in Israel, studied in the Technion, the quote unquote the, the MIT of Israel. Studied in mathematics and computer science. Uh, Ten years ago, and some change, uh, moved to the Bay Area to work for Facebook. So I worked there as a software engineer. Also, where I met my co-founder, Andre. So we started on the same team on the same day together. So I worked at Facebook for two and a half years, then left to do to do the startup thing. So I worked on a startup called Urban Leap for five years. That was a government procurement platform. So two years ago, we decided to shut it down and move on. And while that experience was shutting down was quite painful, I did fall in love with startups. So... I swear, the next morning, I was full full of motivation and energy to do it again, hopefully do it very differently and much, much better, and start exploring the, the, the healthcare space. And so what led me to the healthcare space? So as I mentioned, seven years ago, uh, I met Gabby. We met just before Gabby started med school. So we had uh, just a few months to fall in love before life became horrible or med school. <laughs> and really through that experience, I got to see two things. One is... From my perspective, clinicians, not only my wife, also your partner, who I happen to know, and all clinici other clinicians out there are the best people in the world. From my perspective, they're really, they're really doing what they're doing and sacrificing a lot for others. It's not the money, it's not anything else. And when you see what happens when they make this choice, it's, this, this passion is very quickly being replaced with burnout. So very quickly, clinicians in the healthcare space uh, uh, experience this very real burnout that leads them to oftentimes quit. So today, we have kind of a drain of more clinicians are quitting than joining the profession. So ha having those insights and seeing that uh, really things started clicking and in January of last year was the insight of not building an AI stride, but really building, creating a company and building a product for the clinician. Not for the patient, not for the healthcare system, not for efficiency, just making their lives better was kind of the insight that led us to then focus on documentation and building kind of a very simple product and making it affordable. Yeah, so that's that's the story. And uh, yeah, my wife, Gabby, is 
not only the inspiration she had a very she has a very active part in helping us making the right decisions and marketing and then product decisions she's still she's very involved in the making making free what what it is that's amazing and so for our listeners um wanted to highlight that you are one of the rare immediate success stories in ai today in my line of work i meet a ton of companies you are one of the very very few that have hit 10 million of revenue in a year rapid adoption amongst clinicians very like top quartile SaaS metrics but beyond headline metrics, what are the biggest markers of success for you personally as you grow Freed? Yeah, I would say it's pretty much 100% the clinician stories. So it's hard to pick one. I'll share one that was very early, so it stuck with me. So about a year ago, I was I live in Santa Rosa. And in the morning before the craziness starts, I go on a walk in the park. So I go on a walk in the park and I get this phone call from unknown number. And for some reason, I answered it. And this doctor on the phone she's she's like yelling at me she's like hey, this fridge is not working what's 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 going on? i don't know what this person is and how she gets my phone number but i understand that she's a fridge a, a beta user at the time so i'm running home <laughs> and I'm like don't worry i'll help you and when you know we debug it and once the storm is passed she was telling me you know i started my private practice 10 years ago and i've been doing it for 10 years and it's been quite a nightmare that i've decided there's so much administrative work that I decided I'm, I'm shutting it down. I can't keep doing this anymore. And then a few weeks ago, my friend told me about Freed and I decided to try it. And, and it's been so helpful for me. I'm enjoying what I'm doing again that I decided to not shut down my private practice and keep doing what I'm doing. And we hear stories like this all the time. Just before this, I had, we had our own ends with the team. The first thing we do is watch a video from a clinician who shared with us this week how she's literally saying I'm, I'm seeing my kids more again. You have me be a better clinician, a better wife, and most importantly, a better mom. So <laughs> I'm all, all, almost crying when I'm saying that, but this is this, this is truly for me the, the ultimate marker of success. And if we succeed big or face tomorrow morning, for me, that's all, already something uh, meaningful that we, we were able to do. Yeah, I think that's amazing that you get to marry both your love of technology and startups with doing something that resonates so deeply with, you know, your personal life and your goals and seeing, you know, a company that is clearly very, very mission driven. Um, you know, what's what's fascinating to me is that healthcare has been an industry that has historically been so slow to adopt technology. You've broken a lot of this barrier by getting freed in the hands of, you know, over 10,000 clinicians. What's the story there? We've seen so many dead bodies in the healthcare space. The fact that you're actually able to get clinicians paying out of pocket, and again, this is an industry that has historically been slow to adopt tech, but also um, it's been very difficult to monetize. What's What's been sort of the secret sauce behind your success uh, in, in the growth here? No matter which industry and what situation, if you have truly a deep pain and truly a, 10X, a true solution for that pain, that's going to lead to adoption. Again, you can be naive about it to get to your customers, but that is really the, the core of everything. And when you have a pain where, you know, I can see writing notes is the number one pain point clinicians and doctors have. And we built a solution that is 10x better because of the technology wave, not because we're geniuses. That's the first principles. And even in healthcare, at the end of the day, humans want to have a better life and want to enjoy what they're doing. So I think that's really the secret sauce that, you know, even in healthcare, again, you have humans who need help and if you have them with something big in a meaningful way, that would work in every industry at, at the end of the day. And that's sounds like it's true product market fit. What does adoption look like today for practitioners? You know, has the product been pretty sticky and, you know, part of a practitioner's daily workflow at this point? Yeah, so I can maybe I'll tell you a little story so a few months ago two months ago probably um just when we were kind of fundraising as uh, we had an outage and it wasn't too bad it was like a 10 minute outage and within 10 minutes our intercom kind of support tool was full with hundreds of messages of clinicians customers going crazy it's like my day is ruined food is not what am i doing what do you expect me to do you know very angry and frustrated and I'm saying that not because I'm proud that we had an outage. That's not a good thing, but it shows how mission critical this product has, has become to them. 
Uh, and we see it all the time. Once a patient kind of tries to it and falls in love with it, they use it pretty much all day long, every day, because they see patients all the time and use it in 100% of the visits. So the usage is, if we talk about numbers, so on a typical day, we have about 70% of all our paying users using the product for an average of 10 visits, that average, which is about close to three hours of usage, just kind of capturing visits. So it's very sticky, very intense usage. That's incredible. And I know you talked about your first startup, but it must be pretty incredible working somewhere where you see the visible signs of product market fit. Um, you know, in, in the usage and the stickiness so quickly. That's that's great to hear. One question on maybe the why now here, because we've seen sort of a an explosion of AI scribes um, and sort of AI app layer related healthcare products on the market. I'd love to hear, you know, is the why now really sort of the advancements of LLMs? Uh, the pain point has always been there, clearly. Um, what about sort of the current wave of tech innovation has led to the ability for free to um, be adopted so quickly today? Definitely the technological timing was eh, perfect for us. And what's, what you can do now with AI models, we had companies working for five years, spending $30 million to build things, similar products that don't work. Um, so that's 100%. But what did, what did that allow us? It allowed us to build a product with very high quality output but also very simple product. The product is a button. It's a start and stop button and make it very affordable. And this combination of something that is very simple, actually solved the problem and very affordable, allowed us to really, you know, this kind of timing allowed us to to, to do what, what we do today. How do you think about breaking through the noise here? You know, again, I think there have been plenty of AI scribe products launched in the pre-LLM space. And, you know, a lot of those companies used humans, um, you know, in the loop to be able to transcribe accurate outputs. How do you think about um, breaking through the noise and uh, really capturing mindshare in the clinician space? And maybe this might be a good time to discuss differentiation on potentially a distribution or a technical level. So it's very fast breaking through the noise. In, in essence, the insight for free was obsessing about the clinician was about building a product or solving a particular problem. Uh, and I really think that what made us successful so far and what will be will make us successful in, in the future. And I think for us, I see a real opportunity to, I never thought I would say that, but an opportunity to build a true brand. There are no technology brand brands for clinicians that they love. In fact, they hate 100% of them. So I think that's a big opportunity to kind of break through the noise and create something that is that clinicians are emotionally connected to. I think more practically, what we need to do is be realistic that Scribe, what we're doing today is being commoditized quickly. It's quickly becoming a feature in other products. And we need to do the same. We need to build a product where Scribe is a big piece, but is a feature within that. And basically build much richer AI clinician system. And we're doing that right now. We're building a way for clinicians to get the richest and most useful view of their patient. So kind of patient insights, a, a patient facing assistant that goes to the patient before the visit, collects the latest context in a very seamless and useful way to both save time and increase the quality of the, of the visit for both, both sides. Um, so that's what we need to do. We need to uh, then they build a product that is differentiated and different. For, unfortunately, <laughs> clinicians have so many pains across the workflow. Charting is just one of them. So there's more than enough problems. If AI is super relevant for, we have already the clinicians and their user. We, we literally just need to introduce those right experiences and put them in, in their hands. Uh, so that's the ultimate differentiation. Uh, for now, our differentiation is this PLG, so going direct to the clinician that allows us to grow really quickly. The accuracy of our product is still the highest, so that's we have an edge there, but that's not a durable edge. And the affordability. We're kind of the only product that has really this kind of package uh, solution. But again, others are thinking about as well. And it's uh, almost too, too obvious for others not, 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 not to copy and try to do the same, same thing. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, Scribe is just one part of a clinician's workflow that there are so many pain points that are yet to be tackled. When exactly as a founder, from your perspective, is the right time to do a second product? You know, you kind of have product market fit with your first product already. Um, Sounds like you guys are thinking about more of a multi-product approach at this point uh, for Freed. Yes. 
So I would say, so I would say one thing for sure. Before product market fit, everything is about product market fit. After that, things can really diverge in different uh, directions. After product market fit, I really think it depends on the the dynamics of your particular situation. So the going broad on a broad product strategy is the right strategy for us. I think there are three types of startups in the world. So type number one are most startups, and those are startups that never reach product market fit. And those startups ultimately died. No matter what you do, that you know, maybe will get acquired, but you have to find product market fit. That's a necessary step in the life of a startup. The second type of startups are startups that do find product market fit, and then they, let's say, squeeze the lemon to some level of success. Sometimes they're a huge company. You don't always need seven product market fits to be the huge company. But I think the most inspiring type of startups for me are startups that can know how to keep the lightning hitting, kind of know how to find product market fit here and then adjacent product market fit and solve another problem. And I think the, this is what the greatest companies know how to do. And for me, the big challenge for free is to go from being second, the second category company, which that's what we are today, to the third. And we're starting to see signs of product market fit in new areas, but I would definitely say we're still kind of the second type. And uh, I think being successful at this transition will be the deciding factor whether it gets sold in a couple of years or become a much more durable and big and longer term company. So that's our num- number one priority. And time will tell whether <laughs> whether we succeed in this in this transition. But of course, uh, as the CEO of the company, I'm optimistic that we will. Yeah. And it's not easy to build a multi-product company. You know, very few have been successful at this. I know Rippling and a couple of others have been some of the few that have executed well. And something that you just said resonated really deeply with me, which is it's all about hiring excellent people and empowering them to do their best work. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, I've heard over and over again from folks at Freed that this is the best team that they've ever worked with. Um, and, And so hearing that from folks directly has been uh, just really incredible. I'd love to hear how you keep a high bar on hiring quality as you continue to grow and build the company. I think just remembering that every single person at this stage can truly make or break your company. But not only that, every single person can make every day in your life coming to work can make you happier or more miserable. Remembering that that as well, I think is very important because you are bringing someone who you're going to interact with every day and will take everybody in a 30 person company has a huge area of, of ownership and impact on the company. So really remembering that when you make that decision. Number two, I would say that for me, hiring is really about having a really good process, you know, very clear process to make the decision very scientific and objective. But at the end of the process, you need to follow your gut. So Dan, Daniel Kahneman, who recently uh, uh, passed away, said that intuition is great if you apply it later in, in your assessment process, not not on based on first impression. So really good process, and then follow your gut. I think you can't. There are two things I'm even realizing you can't do. You can't not hire A players. You know, you can't kind of hire good enough. But there's also there's good enough. There's A players and there's like the rock stars, and you also can't just hire rock stars because then you'll have a team of four people and and also it actually doesn't work as well if you think of I don't know the the Chicago Bulls in the 90s so you have Michael Jordan and you have other great players that are not Michael Jordan but that works you know they did win the NBA quite a few times so really kind of realizing that there is a spectrum in which you can you can operate and you can't just aim for the for the for the very end of it but the range and how you balance different teams with rock stars and A players and, and so on. Um, so these are some thoughts about hiring. You know, one of the more courageous decisions that I know you've made is um, building in public. So the lucky reason I'm able to share so many of your stats on this podcast today is your Twitter account. You know, you you do tweet a lot about team building, building in public, metrics. Uh, what were some of the decision points that led you to want to share a lot of this information. I know a lot of your competitors, for example, uh, are not doing the same. Let's start with the story. So two weeks ago, I I tweeted something that uh, blew up in my face. The tweet was roughly along the lines of, whenever I s- speak to a candidate who mentions work-life balance in an interview, I immediately pass on them. Next line. 
a startup can offer a chance of winning or a work-life balance, but it can't offer both. So my point here is that there's also a cost to it. Besides the effort, you know, sometimes things that you write, you know, being very transparent means that sometimes people wouldn't understand you the right way. Again, this particular tweet was just, I guess, maybe stupid on my part, but <laughs> whatever. For me, the reason I do it is, I think, twofold. One, I discovered in the last few years that writing is really something that I deeply enjoy. I think I'm good at it. And it also helps me think and reflect. Number two, it's really in my nature to be extremely transparent and extremely open. Yet I don't know how to operate in a different way. So, you know, my team, everybody in, the, in my team knows everything about the company. Um, anybody who asks me, including competitors, I don't care telling them. I just don't. I think that it's an easier way to live and in many cases more, has more upside than downside. So the combination of the two is what led me to building in, in, in public. What are some of the biggest learnings from your previous startup, you know, as a second time founder? Um, I think, you know, what feels different this time around with Freed versus Urban Leap? Yes. Let's start with what feels different. When we started Urban Leap, it got us to, hey, let's, let's do a startup. You know, it's the cool thing to do. We're in the Bay Area and we can afford it. So I'm glad I've done it. And I think it was a great decision, but it was not a very genuine thing to do. It was kind of, you know, we are doing a lot of what startups and what funders are supposed to do. And that's the biggest difference. Everything in Preet is extremely genuine. You know, I follow, I, I follow the data, but mainly follow kind of my gut and what I believe is right in terms of brand and the people we hire and how we do things. So I would say that's the main difference. In terms of concrete learnings, so there's probably, Urban Leap was five years, so there's probably 5,000 <laughs> learnings there. The top three, I would say, are number one by a margin is who are you building for? For me, building to government people, as much as I appreciate them, you know, I didn't even have the right to build for them. I don't know them. I don't have access to them. I don't know what they need. I don't understand their lives. Who, who am I to try and make their lives better? I can try, but it's destined to fail. And most importantly, if I'm not in love with them, and after five years, why would I keep going? And that's what happened. We couldn't, I couldn't keep going anymore. With Fritz, it's very different. I'm in love not only with my wife, with every single customer. They send us feedback. Even that, I'm just like, yeah, I just want to do more for them for forever. So that's the number one thing. If you, you need to make sure you have a reason to obsess about a user and the right and the access to that user. So that's number one. Number two is for a startup, if you don't have speed, truly nothing else matters. The right speed for a startup is always faster and really obsessing about that. And everything we do with Freed from the hiring to how we do things, to our values, to what is the second thing I mentioned in every q and It's really about speed. We have this speed corner that we talk about small and big things we do to move faster. So no patience for slowness is the value we have at Freed. And number three, I would say is that, let's call it not being naive about product, the combination of product and go-to-market. So product initially is more important, but you have to pretty early on figure out how the product works with the go-to-market. It's really, it's really a one package and what, how your product works enables the product, the go-to-market, the go-to-market to influence the product. And something that we've done differently in three years from the beginning is to test the go-to-market and figure out how to get the users from very early on and combining the two in a way that really works perfectly together uh, to allow it to be something and put it in the hands of users really quickly. So just to summarize, because I'm speaking a lot. So one is the, who are you building for? The most important decision, making sure that you're moving faster than, you know, as, as fast as you mean it possible and faster and faster every week. And number three, make sure to think about product and go to market kind of hand in hand and not go to market is not definitely not an afterthought that solves, solves itself. Awesome. Well, Eris, thank you so much for sharing so many of your insights on company building, on team building. I'd love to Thanks close sir. out the interview with a couple of questions we love asking um, all of the folks we bring on to AI Unveiled. Uh, the first one being, what Gen AI use case are you the most excited about? Number one is bring clinicians, which is what Pre does, of course. And so you are looking for. So the second one is, I do love writing. And I'm still waiting to have this kind of 
AI writing counterpart that truly understands my style. Currently, it's my wife because AI is still not quite quite there. But every day, I'm testing you know the latest models and give them different prompts to try and make it so it can not replace my writing, but really help me. Let's reframe this. Let's write this to it in a different way. Um, but getting the style right is, is very hard with AI still, which interestingly, one of the challenges for Fred is to make the scribe learn the style of the clinician. So it's also a problem that we're trying to solve for in our use case. But yeah, AI counterpart, white writing counterpart is the use case I'm still waiting for. Me too. Uh, I unfortunately do not love writing as much as you. So I'm still looking for that AI co-pilot that will write all of my uh, decks for me. But um, <laughs> yes. anyway, what is something that you believe that the rest of the world doesn't? Uh, something that I believe in is that startup is a terrible idea. And I think that doing a career in entrepreneurship is a great idea. Uh, and let me try to explain it. I think when you go and do a startup, there's a very high chance that you would um, you know, fail, not succeed, um, and also do the wrong things if you're just like optimizing to just really obsess about making that thing successful versus thinking about yourself as a person who dedicates their career to kind of building companies and figuring out how to be great at it. And I think if you do the latter, you have a really good chance in 10 or 20 years or whatever to do something very valuable and be successful. But if you just try to do a startup, I think you'll be, you just need to force you to think short term and not really think about how to ultimately be successful. So don't start a startup, do a career in entrepreneurship. Of course, they are related, but the more you can think about dedicating your life or 20 years of your life to that, I think you're gonna, you actually have really very high chances to to succeed. And I think I'm a good example of that. My first startup was, let's just do a startup, not successful. And three it is, again, the verdict is still out, but much different. And, you know, there was pretty good chances that I wouldn't have done three. I think I was lucky to success with it and do the second one, but this is so much different that it would be such a shame to do one and not do the second. Makes a ton of sense. And it sounds like if you're not starting a company, the best thing you can do to make an impact is to join a rocket ship that is taking off. Um, what are the best ways that candidates can get in touch with you, with Freed? Uh, it sounds like, you know, in this interview, you've really outlined what you're looking for in top tier talent. Um, would love for our listeners to hear more about the best ways to get in contact with you if um, they're interested in joining. Yes, but love that. So we are uh, definitely looking for top tier talent and specifically people with true entrepreneurs who want to build those zero to one products and work on small teams on really new stuff and put them in the hands of now 10,000 clinicians. The way to reach out, so our website, read.ai as a career, as a career page. You can also email me if you like, Erez, E-R-E-Z, at getfree.ai. And our head of people ops, Gabby, not my wife, another one, G-A-B-B-Y at getfree.ai. You can follow me on Twitter if you'd like or reach out there. Um, but really hiring is uh, the number one priority for the company. So we would love to hear from smart people who want to make help us make clinici clinicians uh, happier. Where can our listeners learn more about Freed and stay updated with your latest developments? I know your Twitter is a great place to start. <laughs> <laughs> My Twitter is probably the best place to start because we are so... Now we're not doing a lot in terms of kind of marketing and sharing more. Um, but we will soon have a blog and more, more on our website. For now, I would recommend probably following my, my Twitter is uh, uh, the best place or just reaching out by email if you want to ask anything <laughs> specific. Awesome. Well... Eris, thank you so much for all of your time, your insights. Again, just super rare to get to speak with a founder who has grown the company so quickly um, and is both mission-driven and, and really, at least in terms of early metrics, very much rocket ship potential. And so wanted to thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. And definitely want to encourage listeners to subscribe and tune in for more future episodes with other great AI founders. <laughs>